Okay, so uh, let me begin by acknowledging my uh, collaborator on this project. This is something that um, Ben Feinstein and I have been working on uh, for a um, truly embarrassing number of years. Uh, um, hopefully, actually giving these talks will be the, the occasion to finally finish writing this up and, and send it off somewhere. Um, but this is, this is joint work. Um, that began when Ben was uh, still a graduate student. And so let me do a little bit of a uh, stage setting here. Um, the, the gauge argument um, is a mainstay of quantum field theory textbooks, um, not just quantum field theory. You, you see it in um, quantum optics, um, elsewhere in physics, um, which is uh, striking for a number of reasons. It's um, presented, you know, with, with variations on the details here, but it's presented as a derivation of the existence of a, a certain kind of entity, a uh, Yang Mills field. Um, and moreover, the form of their interactions uh, with matter, in some cases, also the form of uh, their own uh, sort of self interactions. Um, from very weak premises and premises that are surprising in that they uh, seem to be about the um, formal properties of certain fields. They, they have to do with, to, the premises have to do with what sorts of transformation properties we should um, expect or require a certain Lagrangian to have. And so this argument pattern uh, presents some puzzles. Um, uh, on its face, it, it seems very strange to think that um, an ontological claim, a claim about what sorts of um, fields exist in the world and what their, their dynamics are, um, can possibly follow from premises that um, look, first of all, purely mathematical, but also have this character of um, uh, um, having to do with what changes in certain presentations or representations of mathematical relationships. Um, and so that looks a little bit strange. I mean, there's a more general background issue here regarding a tension between two ways that you sometimes see um, gauge discussed in both the physics literature and the, the philosophy literature. So on the one hand, um, you see uh, the word gauge referring to a, a cluster of different things, you know, gauge fields, gauge transformations that are sometimes said to, to lack physical significance, right? They're, they have something to do with, um, in, in the words of, of John Ehrman, uh, descriptive fluff, right? So it's it somehow, um, these are degrees of freedom that our theories have that don't represent anything in the world. Um, so there's a tension between that way of thinking about gauge and another way of thinking about gauge, um, sort of, you know, exhibited by the gauge argument um, and the, the um, uh, you know, importance of gauge theories or Yang Mills theories uh, in particle physics, where one thinks of gauge or the gauge argument as as being the logic of nature as or some you know revealing something fundamental about how um, how physics works and it seems very strange to think that sort of these extra degrees of freedom in our theory could somehow nonetheless be essential to the logic of nature now um, this tension has been observed many times before the gauge argument has been criticized um, by philosophers of physics um, perhaps most uh, compellingly and, and influentially by uh, Chris Martin uh, in uh, a 2002 paper. I mean, yeah, he has a few papers on this, this is from his dissertation, um, but it's been, it's been discussed and criticized by others as well over the years. Um, so as I said, the standard presentation is one on which it seems to yield something from nothing, which of course hints that there are background assumptions here that aren't being made clear, or maybe the argument just doesn't work at all. Um, 
And what these authors, as I say, especially Martin, have, have emphasized is that when you, you scrutinize the moves in standard textbook presentations, um, they end up looking ad hoc and unmotivated. And it looks as if what's actually happening is you're putting in the, uh, the, these big conclusions by hand and that the argument isn't doing the work that it's supposed to do. And so what I wanna to do today is um, present a uh, contrarian perspective on all this. Um, I wanna argue that in fact, the gauge argument is much more compelling than philosophers of physics have generally uh, acknowledged. And that in fact, it can be substantially recovered rigorously and convincingly as an argument concerning the structure needed to express the dynamics of matter. Um, and in particular, I wanna emphasize a sense in which the gauge argument I mean, I, I wanna think of the gauge argument as having two parts, um, both of which I think are well-motivated and can, can be um, set up clearly. But the first part of the gauge argument um, is one that, that uh, I wanna argue is very, very similar to an argument that philosophers of physics love, um, which is the uh, uh, argument originally due um, in some form to Herman Weil, uh, but really, um, sort of drawn out by Howard Stein in his uh, 1965, 1967, I think it was published paper, uh, um, Newtonian space-time, which is the argument for why we should move to Galilean or neo-Newtonian space-time um, from Newtonian space-time, given the, the dynamics of uh, uh, Newtonian gravitational theory. Um, and so, I'm gonna argue that the gauge argument has that character um, and that uh, uh, the philosophers of physics who are comfortable with arguments of that form should also be comfortable with the gauge argument. Now, of course, you know, there's gonna be a little bit of uh, sleight of hand here. Um, I'm going to, I say, substantially recover the gauge argument. I'm going to, to show how sort of the principal moves of the gauge argument can be recognized as corresponding to the moves one will make in an argument of this form. Uh, now, I think that that um, this does show what's going on with the gauge argument in a helpful way. But I also think that it ends up uh, showing that we should think about Yang Mills theory or Yang Mills fields in a somewhat different way than um, we uh, sometimes see um, in both the physics and philosophy of physics literatures. Um, okay, so. This is a two-part talk. Uh, I have um, uh, four main sections. Today is gonna be mostly uh, set up and background. We're gonna do sections one and two of presenting the gauge argument and then discussing uh, criticisms of the gauge argument. Um, and then uh, next Monday, I will um, uh, show how I suggest we recover the gauge argument. Um, and, and for that, I'll, I'll begin by um, presenting the Weil-Stein argument, which is of course very familiar, but um, I'm going to, to try to you know, emphasize what I take the, the key moves to be, um, and then show how those moves uh, reappear in the gauge argument properly understood. Okay, so first, the gauge argument, this is sort of a, a standard uh, textbook account following the, um, the presentations in the uh, philosophy of physics literature. So, um, this is basically the same presentation that Chris Martin gives. The main difference, though, is that I'm going to consider scalar fields, whereas he considers spinner fields. Um, there's really no difference for our purposes. It just simplifies the, uh, the mathematics a little bit. Um, and we're going to work entirely in Minkowski space time and what follows. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to begin by considering a certain kind of matter field. We're gonna consider a complex scalar field. We're gonna define this analogously to how we would define a real scalar field. It's gonna be a map from our manifold, um, the manifold of Minkowski space-time to uh, the complex numbers. Um, and we're gonna take it to represent electrically charged matter. Um, there's a, a standard equation of motion for uh, this field. It's the charged Klein-Gordon equation which uh, is just the regular Klein-Gordon equation, except that phi is complex. Um, M here is the mass of the field. 
Now, this equation of motion can be derived from a Lagrangian. Um, again, a totally standard Lagrangian that you would find in, in textbooks. Um, it's the uh, uh, Euler Lagrange equation of this Lagrangian. Okay, and so you derive the Klein Gordon equation by varying this with respect to phi. Okay, so let's now reflect on the symmetries of this Lagrangian. Um, if you give me a constant real valued field, lambda, we consider the transformation that um, phi goes to uh, e to the i lambda times phi. We consider how the Lagrangian transforms under that transformation. We find is that um, it's left invariant, right? And this is, I mean, this is trivial, just the, the exponential terms uh, come out of the derivatives because lambda is constant um, and uh, um, they uh, cancel each other. Okay, so this transformation gets a name. We're gonna call this kind of transformation a global gauge transformation. We just observed a particular symmetry property of a Lagrangian we've already written down. Um, the uh, varying over the values of lambda yields a representation of U1 on C. Um, it just uh, sort of allows us to implement a, a phase transition, a phase, you know, a change of, of, of phase of the complex um, field value. You can think of it as a, a rigid rotation in the complex plane. Um, now, this U1 group ends up being a variational symmetry group, um, and it has an associated another current. So we can derive that again in totally standard ways. This uh, shows that um, the charge current density is uh, divergence free, and it's a way of recovering the idea of um, conserved global charge for a charged scalar field. Okay, so far all I've done is run a standard Noether's theorem argument. I haven't yet started the gauge argument. I'm just observing some properties of this Lagrangian. But now here's when the, the gauge argument begins. We ask, what if, instead of looking at the transformations I've already introduced, we considered a broader class of transformations? Um, ones that we again write in the same way, phi maps to e to the minus i lambda phi. But now we suppose that lambda isn't constant, but rather is some smooth scalar field. It, it varies over the space-time manifold m. Now, performing the same calculations, we find that the Lagrangian is manifestly not invariant under such transformations, which again are going to get a name. We're going to call these local gauge transformations. Okay, and so this failure of invariance, um, you know, make of it what you will at this stage, right? Um, it's uh, uh, just the observation that this is not part of the uh, variational symmetry group of the Lagrangian as we've written it. However, you one observes, if you were to make a small modification to the Lagrangian, you were to introduce another term um, and endow that term with some sort of stipulated transformation properties. It will turn out that the Lagrangian now is invariant under these local gauge transformations. And so here we're, we're imposing uh, a new uh, symmetry property for this Lagrangian. Define a vector field A, write the Lagrangian in this form. We, we modify our derivative terms by adding this vector field A. Um, and uh, what we find is that as long as A satisfies uh, this transformation rule, right? So um, uh, whenever I change phi by, you know, my, my local U1 transformation, I also change A um, by uh, subtracting this uh, uh, new one form that I get by taking the exterior derivative of lambda. Um, then the modified Lagrangian is invariant. One way of thinking about this is that I've, I've chosen these transformation rules for the uh, vector field A uh, so that they cancel the term that arises from the derivatives acting on phi. 
Now, we observe at this point that in trying to figure out how to implement local gauge invariance, we've needed to introduce a new field. This new field is coupled to phi in the sense that, you know, just it's multiplied by phi in a Lagrangian. If we're accustomed to thinking about um, Lagrangians in physics, this is the sort of thing that looks like an interaction between a new field that we've, we've put in and uh, the field that we had before. Now, why this particular interaction? Well, this is the interaction that was apparently forced upon us by uh, our choice to insist that the Lagrangian should be invariant under this broader class of transformations. Um, so, voila, we've introduced a new field. This field has to interact in particular ways with phi, apparently. Um, but now you might say, well, look, um, it's nice to have an interaction term, but this, if we really want to think of this as a field, um, which apparently we do at this stage, um, we'd like to introduce some dynamics for this field itself. We'd like it to have a kinetic term. How do we do that? Well, we modify this Lagrangian further introducing a, a kinetic term that is also invariant under these transformations. And it turns out that this, this very simple looking term, um, you just, you just uh, uh, take the derivative, the exterior derivative of uh, this field A, um, and then uh, just, just contract it with itself. I mean, you really can think of this as a kinetic term in the same sense that uh, this first term, the kinetic term for phi is a kinetic term. This is just the derivative of A squared. Um, and so uh, you might think, I, I mean, different people have different presentations at this point. You might say, well, it's, it's miraculous that not only do we introduce this field A, but moreover, uh, the natural kinetic term, just the derivative of A squared is itself gauge invariant. Um, or you might say something like, well, we're, we're looking for the simplest uh, possible gauge invariant term at this point. And uh, isn't it miraculous that that turns out to look like a kinetic term? So we end up through this series of uh, um, inferences and, and posits with the Lagrangian of this form. But now we observe that varying this Lagrangian with respect to A yields a surprise, the inhomogeneous Maxwell equation, where the source term is none other than our conserved another current for phi. And so it seems as if we have derived, or at least um, written down a series of <laughs> sequence of steps that have ended with um, the uh, a Lagrangian that describes the dynamics of the electromagnetic field. And that we've gotten it by imposing gauge invariance on a matter Lagrangian. Okay, so, and it's not just that, we've actually learned something about the properties of this new field. Because um, if we're going to require that whatever Lagrangian we write down here uh, is going to be invariant under this uh, uh, class of transformations that we've described, these local gauge transformations, then it had better be the case that we don't write down new terms that fail to be gauge invariant. And so, for instance, you might have thought that the natural mass term for this field would have the form of uh, A squared times some some parameter representing the mass. But that term would not be invariant under these transformations. And so whatever we've done, we've introduced, we were, we're forced to introduce a massless field. Okay, so that's uh, the, the standard presentation of the gauge argument. Um, uh, if you're feeling uncomfortable at, at this point, then you're not alone. Um, Virtually every philosopher of physics who has uh, looked at this has um, walked away thinking that, um, well, with suspicion. Um, and so let's walk through some of the critiques that uh, Martin gives of the argument. And you know, he raises three main issues, which I'll describe in a bit of detail. So the first issue that he raises is that the justification for moving from global to local gauge invariance is unconvincing. And so the requirement that somehow our Lagrangian, which is already invariant under a certain class of transformations, should also be invariant under some broader class of transformations um, is, 
um, something that that is often you know, some justification or others given. I'll describe some in a, a, a minute. Um, I mean, the way I presented it was we're just going to try it out and see what happens. Uh, but um, often, often physicists will argue that there are particular good reasons for making this change. We'll discuss those. Um, okay, two is that local gauge invariance doesn't actually uniquely dictate the form of the Lagrangian. Um, and so uh, it's not quite as inevitable, even after you accept that we have to move or will move uh, from global to local gauge invariance, it's not uh, inevitable that we end up with precisely the Lagrangian that um, I presented. There are other gauge invariant terms, one could add, um, which would not give rise to Maxwell's equations. Um, and then finally, uh, this last step that um, uh, we've somehow introduced the field F, right? The exterior derivative of our new field A. Um, it's not a derivation, right? We've, we've just said, well, wouldn't it be nice to have a kinetic term, um, right? And, and so, you know, one of the things that I, I led with was the observation that it seemed like we were moving from a, uh, a claim about the transformation properties of a certain expression of some dynamics to an ontological claim about the existence of a certain field. Um, but when you look at how the argument actually went, uh, we introduced you know, this requirement of uh, local gauge invariance. We um, saw that we could uh, get it by introducing this vector field A, but then we made this further step of, well, if we're going to think of that as a real field, it had better have some self-interaction or some kinetic term. Um, and so we haven't derived that it's a real field in this sense. We haven't derived that it has a kinetic term. We've said, well, we would like it to have a kinetic term and then we've chosen some. Okay, so let's, let's walk through these uh, in a bit more detail. So um, what kinds of justifications do you see in the literature for the move from global to local gauge transformations? So one justification you see sometimes is that a um, local gauge invariance is necessary for the theory to be a local field theory, that somehow having global symmetries is um, unacceptable given the, uh, you know, our, our preference in physics for um, locality. But as Martin rightly points out, uh, this is a, a totally spurious argument um, a local field theory is one whose Lagrangian at a point depends only on the field and its derivatives at that point, uh, as opposed to depending on values of the field elsewhere. Um, the Lagrangian that we wrote down to begin with is already a local field theory in this sense. There's no non-locality uh, implicit in this, this theory. Its symmetries um, uh, are global in a particular sense, but that's simply not to the point when we talk about what local field theories are. Um, here's another justification that you sometimes see, uh, related in a way to the first, but somehow you might expect, or some people have argued, local gauge invariance is a requirement of special relativity. So the idea is that global gauge transformations enact the same change on our fields everywhere. And how are you supposed to communicate the uh, what gauge transformation to make to distant regions of space and time? Um, it would violate relativistic causality, the reasoning goes. Okay, but of course, this is, this is also spurious. First of all, these gauge transformations are passive transformations. We're, we're um, considering uh, how the Lagrangian changes as you uh, change your fields. Um, we aren't envisage, envisaging uh, actually, you know, implementing some sort of gauge transformation on our fields. There's no procedure being described here. There's nothing physically changing. We're asking how would the dynamics change were I uh, to, to consider a different field. Um, and so th there's, there's no sense in which something needs to propagate here. Um, but perhaps more importantly, uh, local transformations is, are um, a strictly larger, like a strictly larger group of transformations than the global gauge transformations. 
So the global gauge transformations are still allowed. They still count as local gauge transformations. Um, and so it's not as if somehow we've gotten rid of those. And if it really were the case that they were either incompatible with the theory being a local field theory or incompatible with special relativity, nothing would be achieved by um, uh, increasing our group of transformations to include the local ones. Okay, so that's, that's the first critique. The second critique is the non-uniqueness critique. And so this is that um, we've uh, um, taken a series of steps that, that ended up leading to this Lagrangian that included both the Klein-Gordon um, terms and the Maxwell terms. Um, but it's not the only Lagrangian we could have ended up with using the kinds of arguments that we've introduced. So there are many other gauge invariant terms that one could freely add. Now, there are some further arguments you could give to uh, um, say that the ones that we did add were the um, uh, most judicious ones to consider. And so there's a certain sense in which uh, this Lagrangian, sometimes called the minimal coupling Lagrangian, um, is the simplest Lagrangian that uh, sort of follows through this logic of uh, um, reasoning. Um, it's renormalizable, and so maybe that's an additional constraint that we should impose on Lagrangians. Um, it's not just gauge invariant, but it's also Lorentz invariant. Um, and uh, it yields second order equations of motion for the coupled system. Okay, but when I presented the argument, standard textbook presentations of the argument don't say here are our premises. They're sort of suppressed. They're um, uh, maybe they're in the background, but we uh, we seem to need them in order to end up with this particular Lagrangian. Okay, and now finally the uh, the last step of the gauge argument, well, which turns on the observation that local gauge invariants led us to introduce this field A. Um, uh, which we then reinterpret as physical. Now, there are a number of issues here. One is that it's a, a, a further step, not somehow forced upon us to say, this is a field that we're going to reinterpret as physical and expect to have its own dynamics. Um, perhaps more importantly, we started with a Lagrangian for a free field. Then we imposed local gauge invariants to get a Lagrangian um, that uh, um, has this field A. But insofar as we're still trying to represent um, the same field phi, or in other words, we're trying to represent uh, dynamics for a field that has the same class of solutions uh, as the ones that we began with, with our, our first Lagrangian, then um, this field A should be gauge transformable to the zero field. Which means that as long as we're talking about the same class of solutions for phi, FAB has to vanish. Um, and so we really are, you know, modifying something by hand here. We're not just uh, uh, going from the class of solutions of, of phi or starting going with from this Lagrangian that we began with um, and then trying to uh, sort of elaborate some of its properties. We're saying this is this new field A um, is going to be allowed to change our solution space for phi uh, in ways that we, we hadn't considered to begin with, right? And so that really does look like we're just putting in by hand um, that uh, we have this, this new entity and that this new entity is going to have to um, have certain kinds of dynamics. Okay, and so it ends up looking like the gauge argument really doesn't do the sorts of things that it was uh, advertised as doing. And so where does that leave us? Well, it seems to me that, that these concerns, the concerns that, that I've just discussed um, have merit, um, at least in the context of the argument as presented. Uh, it really doesn't do what um, it's advertised to, to do. And it really, um, insofar as it, it, it yields the kind of outcome that, that people uh, attribute to it, you're putting a lot more in by hand um, with really quite uh, dubious or unmotivated um, uh, additional assumptions. <laughs>
Okay, and so this is all set up for me to now claim, uh, really as an advertisement for, uh, for next week, that um, the argument trades on principal considerations with real physical significance of a form that um, we ought to be very comfortable with and philosophers of physics have thought about a lot. And so, um, Jamie and uh, Martin, what do you want me to do now? So I think Martin, in your original email, you said I should go for about half an hour. I've gone for about 35 minutes. I could go longer uh, or we could stop for discussion at this point. Um, what, what do you feel? Do you feel like if you went longer, you'd have to, to need another 20 minutes or, or something like five, 10 minutes or 15 or? I don't know. I mean, this next section is, uh, uh, it's short, but I sort of prefer to do it right before the other one because seeing the okay, analogy. Then, then let's let's have a let's have some discussions. So, thank you very much, Jim. And questions away. So, Martin, how do you want us to do this? Should we raise our hand or just talk? Uh, you could just talk. Yeah, I mean, you could raise your hand or talk. I'm looking at the participants list. You know, we'll we'll figure it out. Okay, um, so, you know, it seems to me, I mean, you started with this, some Klein-Gordon equation or whatever, Klein-Gordon representation for neutral particles. And then you said, ah, this is actually charged particles. And so I'm going to consider, I'm going to allow extensions in some sense. And that's the gauge freedom. I would say as a physicist, the moment you said charged particles, I'm going to imagine immediately that there are additional interactions among these charged particles, which a neutral particle would not have. And that would motivate me to make additions. Now, why it should come from a gauge argument, I don't know. But I want to derive equations that have interactions between the particles. And that's really what Maxwell's equations do for me. Um, so, I mean, I understand that you know this wonderful magic that you just look at some symmetries, go from global to local and bang, Maxwell came along. I would say it just says that Maxwell is one way in which my charged particles could interact. Perhaps it's the simplest. I might be able to invent other sets of equations, but basically it is no longer the same theory. You are really setting up a system that has got more internal interactions and you're just figuring out how to describe it in this Lagrangian language. Now, maybe I'm being too simple, but anyway, that's the way I reacted to what you said so far. Yeah, I, so I'm, I think I'm, I'm fine with that. I mean, maybe it was a, a, a flaw of the, my presentation to uh, start by saying that um, this was a charged Klein-Gordon field. I mean, perhaps I should have just said, well, we're now gonna consider what would happen if uh, we tried to study complex valued matter. Um, because all you know, the fact that it was charged doesn't, didn't play any role in the argument, right? And in some sense, you discover that it's charged at the end. You discover that there's this, uh, uh, you know, conserved charge current density, which couples to Maxwell's equations in the right way. Um, on the other hand, uh, what you're saying, Ramesh, is very, I think, very much sympathetic with the kind of line that someone like um, Chris Martin or, or um, uh, Paul Teller would adopt, which is that uh, you're, really, you're really using a lot more physical intuition, your understanding of the situation to arrive at this Lagrangian than um, uh, um, the sort of the problematic versions of the argument uh, seem to allow. Um, on the other hand, I'm gonna argue next week that there's much more to this argument than that. Um, and so uh, um, I, I'll be interested to see how you react to the second part of the argument. Yeah, so that's why I said, I'm only reacting to what I heard so far. There's this big promise in part three and part four, which you have told us is coming. Yeah, so I'll be most interested to see, you know, what you present, yeah, thank you. All right, Jacob.
Hey, James, uh, James, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed this first part of the talk. I'm very much looking forward to the next part. Um, just as a, a quick follow-up, just in terms of presentation, um, you know, positing that we should move from considering real uh, scalar fields to, to complex valued scalar fields uh, is, you know, maybe a, a, another way to think about it is that we're going from one scalar field to a pair of scalar fields with, you know, a simple U1 rotation symmetry between them, right? That, that, because essentially that's what we're doing with a complex valued field to, to begin with. Um, and that argument neatly generalizes to, you know, SU, SU3, you know, uh, O3, other kinds of symmetry groups that, that fields can have. And then this argument can generalize to non abelian gauge theories. Um, so let me just quickly say that when I, when I um, heard that you're gonna be giving this talk, I was very interested to see it. I'm very interested to know uh, what the current thinking is on this, um, you know, from the, the sort of philosophy of physics community. In, in physics, uh, as you probably know, um, I think there's really been a move away from this way of thinking about gauge theories. Uh, by the time I was taking courses in quantum field theory, this was not the argument that was presented anymore. Um, you know, Peskin and Schroeder was, I think, maybe the last major book I can think of that presented things in this way. The, there's been a real push toward what I would call the Weinbergian approach. Mm -hmm. Right. In, 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 the, in that presentation, you, you go down to what you, how you define what you mean by particles in terms of representations of, of uh, you know, uh, you know, Wigner's argument, the representations of the uh, Poincaré group. And then once you get down to classifying the different representations, you find that you have particle types of different spin and different mass. And when you start talking about spin one or greater massless particles, you just find that they have to behave like gauge theories. Um, and that's, that's the way the argument has been, ha, had been presented by the time I took a course in quantum field theory in graduate school. Uh, and, you know, I think there are some advantages to that argument. One is that um, the sort of symmetries that come from these Wigner arguments already tell you what the kinetic terms have to look like so that they're not just ad hoc guesses anymore. Uh, you can also get pure gauge theories this way. One of the downsides of the of the art of the argument where you start with taking a global symmetry and gauging it is you have to presuppose you've got matter that couples to the gauge field. Um, there is no argument to just jumping to a pure gauge theory, which we do frequently now. Uh, you know, so there's there's no argument from this point of view why we should only have one gauge field and not n independent u uh, one gauge fields. Um, the other advantage to, to these, I think, more modern arguments is that they don't rely on Lagrangians. So you don't run into problems with uh, gauge theories that don't have obvious Lagrangian descriptions. An example being, you know, electromagnetism with magnetic monopoles. It's not clear how to write that in Lagrangian form. Um, uh, it, you know, and then, so I, I think, uh, I just, I just, I guess I don't have a, 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 a specific pointer, except that I, I guess I, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little, I guess, confused by, and maybe this will be resolved with your next talk, but I guess I'm a little confused about what the, the reason is to try to resuscitate this argument, given that I think it's just, it doesn't represent, I think, to a large degree, how people think about quantum field theories nowadays. Mm -hmm. Thinking of gauge theories as being, you know, field theories of massless particles on their own merits, rather than viewing them as uh, derivative things or, you know, um, parasitic on on matter. Mm -hmm. So okay, so um, there's a lot a lot there to react to. Um, so first. Um, I think um, 
okay, I guess, I mean, maybe the first thing to say is that every, everything that I'm doing here is classical. Um, and so uh, thinking about what the structure of Yang Mills theories are classically um, is something that isn't often done, um, but I think can have some value. Um, and one reason why I think it has some value is that um, thinking about what sorts of arguments we found compelling elsewhere in classical physics when applied to Yang-Mills theory um, helps, from my perspective, helps us to see what the relationship is between Yang-Mills theory, general relativity, and other sort of geometrized theories of, of gravity or non-geometrized theories, you know, so classical gravitational theory and geometrized Newtonian gravitation. Um, now, it may turn out that uh, those are the wrong ways of thinking about Yang-Mills theory. And maybe that the reason it's the wrong way to think about Yang-Mills theory is that Yang-Mills theory isn't really a classical theory, that really what we need to do is understand it from the perspective of quantum field theory. Um, but if that's right, then being able to follow through how this goes wrong um, seems to me to be at least one route to thinking about what's going on in general relativity and how we're thinking about that wrong from the perspective of a future theory of quantum gravity. And so um, it seems to me as if what, what often ends up happening is um, we have a, um, a community of people working in general relativity who, who are accustomed to thinking of that theory in one way. We have a community of people thinking, you know, working in particle physics who are accustomed to thinking about quantum field theory in one way. Um, and then we have some butting of, of heads. And you know, people have, of course, you know, Weinberg, of course, himself has explored the Weinbergian approach to general relativity um, and has spent a lot of time and lots of, you know, lots of people in particle physics think this way, um, thinking about what general relativity would look like um, if presented in the sort of way that um, uh, we normally think of Yang-Mills theory. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I think that's fine. I think that this is sort of going in the, the, opposite, the opposite direction in order to understand how these sort of networks of theories work at the classical level um, to better understand them at the quantum level. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is that uh, one reason why you might give up on an argument of this form um, is because you think the moves don't work, right? And so now you just move to, to some other way of, of thinking about what the logic of uh, gauge theories is. But if it turns out that the moves do work, it sort of invites reconsideration of um, what the relative status of this argument versus what you're describing as the more modern arguments. Is. Um, and I guess the, uh, the final comment is that what we mean by uh, gauge theory seems to me a bit ambiguous. So um, there are um, So, I mean, we don't, we don't know of any pure gauge theories in the sense that you've described in nature. Um, all of the gauge fields that, that we're aware of interact with matter. Um, and so now you can ask, well, is that, is that just luck? The world is complicated, everything interacts with everything. Um, or is that because um, gauge fields perhaps are parasitic on matter? And what would it mean to say that they're parasitic on matter? Well, you might think, um, what gauge theories are doing is describing the curvature of matter spaces um, in the same way that general relativity is, you know, and, and you can of course talk about vacuum solutions, but it's very difficult to, to say what it means that space time is curved without saying, well, matter evolves in the following way in this context. You know, gauge theories have a very similar kind of mathematical character. Um, and so thinking about theories that, that couldn't be uh, uh, coupled with matter seems like a, a little bit um, 
a, a little bit confusing. Um, and, and similarly, uh, yeah, like, at what point are you no longer talking about gauge theories? Or at what point are you no longer talking about yang mills theories? And a similar thing happens in gravitational theory, where you have general relativity and you have various generalizations of general relativity. It's not really clear that our standard way of interpreting general relativity carries over to all of the uh, um, modified gravity scenarios that are considered. That, of course, doesn't mean we shouldn't consider them, but it does mean that we need to be attentive to you know, where we're taking for granted that a certain interpretational strategy is going to continue to work um, and where it isn't. And it seems to me like that's the same cluster of issues that, that come, up, come up here. Thank you, yeah, I appreciate that very much. Are there any other comments or questions? That was a, was a good interaction between Jim and Jacob there. Neil has a hand. Hi, Jim. Um, hey, Neil. Hey, uh, I just want to ask a quick question about, um, yeah, one thing that you kind of touched on briefly. So you sort of mentioned in passing this idea that well, look, so insofar as we think we're dealing with the same theory, where there's a sort of implicit assumption that FAB has to be equal to zero. So you can just say a little more about how you're thinking of that. It's the idea that we've sort of written down this Lagrangian um, that has this term FAB in it, but there's like a secret side condition that FAB is required to vanish or something. Is oh, that so, kind of the... Well, so, so this is, so first of all, this is, this is one of Chris Martin's arguments. Um, and I, I take it that the, the point here is to put pressure on the idea that we have derived the existence of this, this field as a real physical entity in, in some robust sense, as opposed to putting that in by hand. Um, and right, so you know, I started by saying, isn't it odd to think that by, by saying something about the transformation properties of a Lagrangian, we can derive something about like the furniture of the world. And here, what I take Chris to be saying is, no, you're, you're putting in this thing about the furniture of the world, now you're exploring its properties, which seems like a much weaker sort of mm -hmm. you know, outcome. Mm -hmm. um, and the, so the idea is just, if we really were starting with this Lagrangian and then somehow exploring its formal properties as we expand its group of symmetries, um, we, uh, it's not at all clear that we can get from there exists, you know, we can add this term to our Lagrangian to this term can, can take on non-zero values. Right? You, you have to somehow consider a, a broader class of um, uh, solutions to the, I mean, actually fields that aren't solutions to the original equations of motion. Now, you might think that once the term is in the Lagrangian, it's perfectly natural to start varying things with respect to it. Um, and, and, you know, once you do that, then you're gonna have a broader, you know, a larger set of, of, of equations, and you're gonna look for solutions to that joint set of equations, which of course won't have FAB equals zero. Mm -hmm. And actually just on that very last sentence, so you think there to be a kind of conceptual connection between the idea that FAB can take non-zero values in possible solutions and FAB is something that we should vary in order to, when doing the kind of Euler Lagrange um, well, I mean, you'd have to come up with some gauge argument prime that introduced a Lagrange multiplier or something like that if you right. if you didn't want that outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, okay. I, I suppose you could just fix that, you know, some background value for FAB and then consider varying phi. Um, uh, it's not really clear that you're guaranteed to get consistent right. solutions if you do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Any other questions or comments? Fingers. If there are no other questions, I have uh, a somewhat tangential question. I, I don't want to preempt anyone if, if they have. No, no, uh, sure. Sure. 
So I guess I have a question about how to think about gauge invariance more broadly, because we can introduce gauge invariances in other contexts than just uh, like massless fields. So um, for convenience, mm -hmm. if we're considering, for example, uh, a spin one massive boson, right? Like the Broca theory. First of all, I'm not exactly sure how to think about that. Should I think about that as matter or should I think about that as 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 more akin to a massless like, like what what category would a, a massive spin one uh, theory fall under? If I regard a massive spin one theory as matter, uh, there's a you know the Stuckelberg mechanism lets you introduce a gauge invariance for free. Um, that's very convenient for understanding the Higgs mechanism, for example. Um, but there's no matter, other matter fields around. Mm -hmm. uh, and the gauge invariance is clearly just a convenient field redefinition. Kind of like taking, um, you know, uh, a mechanical theory in space time and introducing an arbitrary reparameterization. So now you have a reparameterization gauge invariance just mm -hmm. to make the story easier to give you some mathematical conveniences. I, I guess my, this is why my question is a little bit vague, but how should we think about those other notions of gauge invariance that are clearly introduced, or at least prima facie introduced just for mathematical convenience, uh, and that don't seem to connect up with these particular arguments? Um, so, Because one classical way, this is a totally classical way to think about, so I guess this does connect a little bit up with the arguments I said before. If you want to, to see why the massless case um, has standard gauge invariance, a totally classical argument that doesn't invoke quantum mechanics as far as I know is to start with the Broca equations, uh, use the Stuckelberg mechanism, which is just a convenient field redefinition to introduce a gauge invariance. And then at that point, you can take an unproblematic limit as mass goes, as the mass parameter, which you don't think of quantum mechanically, it's just a parameter in the classical field equations. You take that mass parameter to zero and you're left with a pair of theories. You're left with uh, the theory of a, a, a scalar boson, uh, which corresponds to the longitudinal mode if you want to think quantum mechanically, but you don't have to. Um, and you're left with the standard uh, Maxwell equations. That's a totally classical argument and you can see the emergence of gauge invariance there. I mean, there is a quantum mechanical story you can tell, and it does dovetail beautifully with the quantum mechanical story and with the Higgs mechanism, because it's essentially the Higgs mechanism in reverse. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm just trying to understand like, well, so, so how that fits into this picture. Um, I guess it's not totally clear to me what that argument is, right? So, um, Normally, if you want to have confidence that you have uh, conclusions that have told you something about the world, you would like it to be the case that your premises tell you something about the world. And so if, if you think uh, that, you know, somehow uh, Proca fields have some compelling representation, like, like, like that there's something in the world that has to satisfy the Proca equations, um, then, you know, sort of running this argument and asking, well, what happens in the case where m is small or m goes to zero seems to make sense. But if you're just writing down some equations and then showing that by manipulating those equations, you end up with some other equations, I'm not sure what we're supposed to take away from that. Uh, well, we do see the Proc equations show up in spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, you know, like in superconductivity, the W and Z bosons. Uh, they, they show up, but like what, I mean, yeah. like, do we think that they're somehow um, like a, a general or fundamental characterization of all electromagnetic phenomena such that like if we were to, I mean, if so, that, that seems like a big, like a big additional premise. Well, I mean, there is an argument that non-abelian spin one fields can't have mass terms because mm -hmm. you, you can show that, that you don't get a, a UV complete description. You, you can show that the theory breaks down um, but there's, but although we don't have empirical evidence of this, uh, there's no evidence that, um, you know, an abelian massless uh, gauge field can't be given a mass term in a UV compatible way. There's no, 
as far as I know, um, there's no for reason, for example, the photon can't have a mass. Uh, naively, it might look like you mess things up, but there's a way you can do it where it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, then, then it comes down to, well, for all we know, the photon is secretly a Broca theory mm -hmm. <laughs> with some mass term that's just extremely small. Yeah, so I mean, I, I guess, um, you know, there's one, one way of thinking where you say, well, uh, let's write down all of the terms in our uh, Lagrangian that are uh, not protected by symmetries and see what happens. Um, or we write down all the terms and we start introducing symmetries to get rid of the ones that, that, that seem to mess stuff up for us. Um, you know, there's a sense though in which um, that makes a lot more sense quantum mechanically than it does classically, it seems to me, um, number one. But number two, um, This really, like, so I mean, for me, this really comes back to how you should think about general relativity. Right? So, for instance, you could have a you could have massive spin two gravity. Right? I, I'm not I'm not uh, claiming that that's a, an incoherent theory, um, but I, I would claim that it's it's really quite different from general relativity, um, and forces us to to reconceive of both the, the structure and interpretation of the theory, but also what its solution space uh, is like, because you need to to impose some pretty broad global constraints in order to, to like introduce massive gravitons um, classically. Um, and so, you know, what, what we take to be more important uh, seems to me to be playing a role here in, in um, what seems like a, a more compelling theoretical program. Um, so yeah, I think i leave it at that. All right. Do we have any other friends, comments? Oh, there is a there is a hand, I think, by Harvey. Is that right? Yes. Can Hi, you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Jim. Hey, Harvey. I just thought I'd mention that there's a lovely amusing paper of 1994 by Jose Harris, in which he has a dialogue between God and the devil. And God is extolling the fact that using the local gauge argument, you can derive Maxwell's equation, say from quantum mechanics. And the devil is pointing out there's an ambiguity. And the devil points out that in Maxwell's equations, um, you can take the equation for the curl of E and put and remove the minus sign on the right-hand side. And that's still consistent with the constraints of the local gauge, um, the gauge symmetry. And so what you end up with, with this altered theory that the devil is, is, uh, is promoting, is a theory in which the equations are elliptical, there are no propagating solutions, and there's no invariant speed. And the symmetry group is the Euclidean group, the four-dimensional Euclidean group. Now, you mentioned in your talk that um, that when you introduce the, the kinetic term, it turns out to be Lorentz covariant. Um, and of course that would rule out this particular argument, I guess. Mm -hmm. But again, it seems like an extra, an extra assumption that you're putting in over and above those other locality arguments that you mentioned, mm -hmm. the spurious locality arguments that you mentioned. I just don't know whether you're aware of this paper. It's, it's rather nice. No, I'm, I'm not aware of that paper. Um, thank you. I guess in that same spirit, I would ask, um, what if we had matter with both electric charges and magnetic monopoles? Um, how would that come out of uh, this Lagrangian approach? Uh, so, um, it, It wouldn't, which I mean, I, you might take to be a, a weakness of the the gauge argument if you think that uh, 
um, in fact, we ought to be able to, to consider uh, magnetic monopoles. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> the non-existence of magnetic monopoles uh, is essential to the um, existence of a geometric interpretation of Yang Mills theory. Um, and so there's a real, a real powerful wedge there, right? So um, if the right way of thinking about Yang Mills theory is geometrical in a way that's analogous to general relativity, then you can think of it as a strong prediction that there are no magnetic monopoles. If on the other hand, there are magnetic monopoles, then we know right off the bat that uh, this is not the right way to think about Yang Mills theory, and probably, from my perspective, is not the right way to think about general relativity. Well, that's interesting because if you were looking at this as pure classical electromagnetism, to me, always it was, you know, it was arbitrary to say that you can have electric charges but not uh, magnetic monopoles. And uh, the only argument I have heard is. Well, nature tells us that there are no magnetic monopoles. So we will put div B equal to zero. We won't put anything non-zero on the right-hand side, but that's just a choice. It's meant to describe our universe. But I always took the equations as saying, you know, in principle, I can put a non-zero value and get an equally valid theory. But you are saying that if you went through this deeper approach, starting with some Yang-Mills theory and Lagrangian, et cetera, et cetera, in fact, you're inevitably led to no magnetic uh, free charges. Uh, if, uh, at least on my recovery uh, that I'll present next week of uh, what's compelling about the argument. Yeah, I think that's right. Great. Um, I have a question, follow-up question about that. Um, and Ramesh, thank you for bringing up magnetic monopoles again. Um, you know, in, String theory, one, you know, routinely assumes that you've got a electric, a, a, you know, electric charges and magnetic charges for all the, the various kinds of, of gauge fields that show up in string theory. Um, but I guess it never occurred to me that people regarded this as undermining the geometric interpretation of gauge theories. Uh, in fact, we often appeal to those geometric arguments for, um, you know, explaining charge quantization that arises from, um, you know, that, that, that arises from the presence of, of magnetic charges. Would you mind elaborating a little on that? I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little unclear why that, I mean, certainly if you have magnetic monopoles and electric charges, you can't globally write uh, the Faraday tensor as, uh, you know, the exterior derivative of, of a one form, of a single one form. But then instead what you get is, is you can locally write it that way. And that's really generally what we do when we think about differential forms, right? I mean, it, it's, it's still the case that in vacuum regions, uh, the Faraday tensor is still, um, it's still closed and therefore it's locally exact. Could you elaborate a little on this? I'm, I'm a little unclear. I mean, it, so, so in, in vacuum regions, I mean, so, so if you have a geometrical interpretation, then it's gotta be, it just has to be closed, not closed when there's no matter, right? right? Because then when there's matter, you don't, you don't get to think of it as the curvature of a connection any longer. Right. Um, I, you know, actually I, so um, what string theorists do is above my pay grade, I'm afraid, but it, it seems to me that there is something here that um, is, is quite interesting and, and worth exploring more, um, which is a connection to the, um, the Swampland conjectures. Um, it, so it's my sense that, that the theories you're describing are in the Swampland. Um, I'm not 100% sure that's the case. Um, I mean, That theories that have both electric and magnetic charges are in the swampland. I, I, I'm, I hadn't. I'm not. I'm not, certain, I'm, I'm not certain of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I my my knowledge of any of this stuff is really quite quite um, weak. Um, but I that was the impression that I had from like the three talks on the swampland conjectures that I've seen. Um, was that you know like could, could yeah could, could uh, be true. Yeah, I mean swampland stuff is is recent, so I, I it's possible I'm not aware of this. Yeah, that's that's entirely possible. Um, so 
one thing that, and again, this is this is you know like confidence level around fifty percent, maybe less. Um, it seemed to me as if the sorts of of uh, big takeaways from the swampland papers was that um, the uh, the 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 theories in the swampland um, tended to be ones that violated the sorts of um, uh, principles of good theory building that many people had previously, um, you know, pointed to as things like gauge invariance, like local local gauge symmetries, um, no non-renormalizable uh, scalar fields, things like that. Um, and so, uh, Maybe I'm wrong here, but I, I, I thought that um, electric and magnetic monopoles um, in the same theory were uh, in that category. I mean, there are probably more people in Cambridge who can answer that question than anywhere else in the world. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right, if not, well, let's thank Jim one more time. And we're all very much looking forward to the next uh, installment of um, this talk. Thank you very much, Jim. Great, thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. Thanks, Jim, it was great, great talk. <laughs>